The Houston Rockets pick up a pair of wins over the weekend back to back against the Portland Trailblazers. Just how will these wins impact the tankathon seeding race as the season is coming to a close? Jalen Green, Alper, and Shingun with some really impressive performances. A part of Jalen Green's offensive game that doesn't get enough recognition. Also, the Brooklyn pick watch in full effect. We're going to break down everything coming up right here at Locked on Rock. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another episode of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and also host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Today, I want to talk about the Rockets and their back-to-back -back wins against the Portland Trailblazers over the weekend. The, it, the severity of these wins, right? And just kind of trying to evaluate whether or not these wins actually mean something or if they're going to be kind of net negatives in the long term as far as the tankathon standings are concerned. Going to get into that. Going to talk a little bit about at least the performances from Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun across these two games, as well as taking just a broader look at the rest of the NBA schedule for the Houston Rockets, as well as the two other Tankathon teams kind of nosediving for the bottom of the standings currently in the Orlando Magic and Detroit Pistons with as well, you know, the Oklahoma City Thunder not far away either with all three of those first teams, the, the Rockets, Pistons, and Magic all knotted up at 20 and 55 currently on the season, a three-way tie for the fur for the worst record in the association. And hey, Brooklyn pick watch in full effect. So we're gonna get there as well towards the tail end of the episode. But let's start with let's start with Jalen Green because it really so in, in these pair of you know games against the Portland Trailblazers wa Rockets walking away the first night a 125 106 victory then the second night a 115 98 victory even though that first night it, I mean the Rockets were in control of the game pretty much the entire way like and it, at no point did it really feel like the Portland Trailblazers were actively competing in that game and then the second night however it did feel like the Blazers uh, it was a bit more of a back and forth affair up until the fourth quarter where the Rockets really started to kind of run away with the game. But Jalen Green had a pair of really impressive games in in back to back outings. It was good to see him kind of get those numbers back up to where we want to see him, you know, a couple 20 point nights, really good efficiency, uh, three level scoring from across the board, you know, getting it done inside, getting it done in the mid range, the three ball falling in both of these games, uh, you know, really impressive numbers for him. Five of 10 in the first outing from behind the arc, then six of 11 in the second outing. 23 points the first night, 25 points the second night. Just some really solid overall performances from Jalen Green, right? Nothing, you know, that we've, has come to be kind of, nothing that's been surprising as of late with his performance this second half of the season. And when you're going up against a team that is as depleted as this Portland Trailblazers team is, you kind of expect to see some solid performances because they're not really, you know, again, they're missing nine guys. Like, it's kind of ridiculous at this point. But with Jalen Green, an area of his offensive game that I don't think we've highlighted enough or that has been given enough attention is his ability to relocate without the ball, right? Right. And this is something that obviously this season Rockets fans have been clamoring for. Oh, Jalen needs more touches. He needs more reps, put the ball in his hands, all of this. But I do think there's something to be said for the fact that he spent the better part of the season or a chunk of the season without the ball in his hands. And he's had to learn. And this is, you know, again, credit to the coaching staff for putting him in positions where he's needed to be effective 
off the ball, truly, that he now understands how to relocate and move around without the basketball. Now, he's not exactly right. He's not exactly Steph Curry, you know, running, you know, laps, you know, in an individual offensive possession, trying to get open that way. But it's just the subtleties of paying attention to where the driving lanes are, to paying attention to where defenders are, how he can kind of skirt around the perimeter and fill a gap to where when he gets the kickout pass, he's wide open because his defender's not paying attention. Next time the Rockets play a game, so against the San Antonio Spurs Monday night, Next time you see Jalen Green playing, pay attention to him as the, you know, as the ball is being moved around offensively. Watch Jalen when he doesn't have the ball in his hands. He's very aware about drifting to the left, drifting to the right, filling those shooting, those shooting corners and filling those shooting pockets within the Rockets offense. So that way he gets wide open looks when he gets the kick out. Or if it's not a wide open look, if his defender does have to take that split second to recover. He's not just staying in one spot to where his defender has a quick, easy, oh, I'm just going to turn around and Jalen's right there. No worries, right? The defender is, you know, watching the ball, you know, paying attention to what's going on there. Jalen kind of drifts and finds himself, you know, some distance between himself and his defender, which then either leads to, you know, a wide open three pointer for Jalen, or he can attack off of a, you know, a rushed closeout from a defender who is trying to make up time because they were caught ball watching, not paying attention offensively, right? So that level of awareness to not just be kind of sitting there like, oh, I don't have the ball in my hands. I guess I'll just stay here. But to be proactive offensively in drifting to his spots, getting to areas where he can then be successful to make the next drive and kick opportunity or to have the next you know wide open shot within the Rockets offense, that is a big part of Jalen Green's game that I don't think we've highlighted enough this season in conjunction with his ability, his increased ability now to be more comfortable with the ball, to kind of get going in the mid range, to create his own opportunities there, as well as to just relocate there on the perimeter. We're really seeing Jalen start to kind of flourish and, and piece things together as a multifaceted offensive player. And again, this is exactly what you wanted to see out of Jalen Green, given the rough start to the season, the fact that, you know, we saw some struggles early on. He's really started to piece it together this second half of the season. And this is just an area that I wanted to highlight of his that I think is really going to be important for him down the line and will show that he's capable of not just being a ball dominant on ball scorer, but somebody that given you know, enough options to be able to create for him, be it a point guard like Kevin Porter Jr. to create for him or a big man like Alperen Shingun with the court vision that he has or just the number of drive and kick tools that the Rockets have at their disposal with guys who can drive the ball into the paint and then make that kick out pass. He doesn't have to be the be all end all of the Houston Rockets offense. It's not going to be like a live or die by Jalen Green system down the line, Jalen Green can very much be effective without the ball in his hands. And that's, you know, really promising for the future of this Houston Rockets team and this young Rockets core. But coming up, I want to talk about Alperin Shingun, his career night as well, a career high 27 points for LP, as well as getting into just the impact of these two wins for the Houston Rockets, how they affect the tankathon seeding race, whether or not these wins actually truly mean anything in the grand scheme of things. We're going to get into all of that and more in just a moment after a message from our friends over at Built Bar. Because look, when it comes to protein bars, you've got to pick Built Bar. They are the number one protein bar on the market. If you've never tried a protein bar that you've actually like enjoyed, check out Built Bar. Every single bar coated in 100% delicious chocolate. So so soft, easy to chew. They're not gritty or chalky like other protein bars on the market. The consistency is never like, you know, off, which can happen with other, other brands. And the flavors they've got to offer. Oh, they've got so many amazing flavors. Cookies and cream, raspberry, mint brownie, peanut butter, strawberry. I, I, the list goes on and on. My personal favorite is coconut brownie chunk. That is the GOAT, the number one Built Bar that they have to offer. But every bar is low cal, low sugar, high protein, high fiber. Amazing if you're on a keto diet. A keto diet. Amazing if you're trying to cut back a little bit, maybe lose a little bit of weight. You can check them out. Just go to built.com and use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off your very next order of the best tasting protein bars on the market. Again, that's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you for making Locked on your first listen each and every day. For your next listen, be sure to check out the Locked on Now podcast, nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts, free and available wherever you get your podcast, wherever you listen to this podcast. Now, 
Let's talk a little bit about Alper and Shingun, his big night in the second night against the Portland Trailblazers. LP having himself uh, a really impressive game, 27 points, 10 of 16 shooting. He had seven rebounds. He had three assists. He had a block. I mean, he was plus 13 off the bench in 26 minutes play. Just a phenomenal night from Alper and Shingun. Now, again, kind of echoing the same sentiment from segment one is you'd expect LP to have a big night against this depleted Portland Trailblazers team, but he really just had it going in this second night. Not necessarily, you know, kind of a quieter night in the first meeting between these two teams, just the four points, but he did have six rebounds, had five assists, had a couple steals, you know, was being active throughout the game, but not necessarily filling it up offensively the way that he was in this, uh, in this second meetup between these two teams. Now, for Alper Shingun, you know, this is just about par for the course with him, where when he's given the opportunity, the extended minutes to be out there on the floor, he's put up insane numbers. And in this one, the the, the story was the absolute same. He had it going from, you know, he was able to get a lot of dunks on the interior against this depleted Blazers team. Not only that, he shot two of four from behind the three-point line. You love to see the three ball falling for Al P, especially because he's been much more of a willing shooter this second half of the season, if my if I do still have a gripe with Alpi's game, it's that he's still a bit of a hesitant three point shooter. Well, where where he will catch the ball on the perimeter and kind of you know hesitate to you know he'll he'll pump fake the shot, but the defender's like twenty feet away, fifteen feet away, right? Like the defender, the big man's nowhere near him. And he's like pump faking the shot, and then he hesitates to decide what he's going to do, whether he's trying to kick it to the next man, drive the ball in, that kind of stuff. But you know, to see him go two of four shooting in this one, it's always a welcome sight when the three ball is falling for Al P. But the numbers just don't do not lie, don't lie. <laughs> the numbers don't lie when Alper and Shingun it gets you know legitimate minutes. The numbers back it up. So Alper and Shingun's per thirty six stats when he logs more than twenty five minutes a game, he's averaging nineteen point two points per contest, almost like a hair under ten rebounds per contest at nine point nine rebounds, three point six assists, one and a half blocks per game, fifty percent shooting from the floor, thirty three point three percent shooting from distance, seventy one percent free throw shooting, fifty six point seven true shooting percentage. Total of nine games when he logs more than twenty. Five minutes. Again, Al P has shown so many impressive flashes. At this point, I don't know how you can have any, you know, doubt about the fact that the Rockets are going to be running him consistently here in the future. Like the the whole you know, premise of how this season kind of came about with the start with the double big lineup between Wood and Tice and Alper and Shingun showing, you know, some immediate impact and flashes off the bench early in the season. That kind of threw a wrench into the Rockets game plan, right? Alper and Shingun and Usman Garuba were supposed to be kind of the project bigs this season with Al P soaking up a little bit of minutes here and there throughout the season to get up to speed at the NBA level. And frankly, he came in through the door and was just ready to be an impact player right away, which didn't exactly factor into the Rockets' plans. So you know what they did? They expedited the process by getting Daniel Tice out of the door. Consummate professional. Shout out to Daniel Tice for being a pro's pro throughout the whole process. But they were expecting the two bigs in the main, the mainstay bigs of the Rockets' rotation to be Wood and Tice with Alper and Shingun likely they were projecting him to maybe struggle a little bit to get adapted to the NBA level. Alpi came out and proved he's ready to play right away. So then they had to 86 Daniel Tice. They did that. And now as the season has progressed, we've seen the Rockets kind of deal with Christian Wood and Alper and Shingun both being tethered to that five spot, having to share the minutes with Christian Wood, you know, some games walking away with just 30 or 32 minutes played when conceivably you'd argue Christian Wood should be getting 36, 38 minutes a night as the, you know, arguably one of the best players, if not the best player for this Rockets team. So then you've got Al P being tethered to that five spot directly, you know, his minutes directly correlating to whether or not Christian Wood gets more or less minutes. And so then we start seeing Steven Silas toy with the double big lineup, bringing it back, having Al P and Christian Wood share the floor together, letting Al P play some reps with C Wood out there on the floor, even closing a game or two with Christian Wood, the two of those guys sharing the floor together. That gives me the confidence that moving forward, we're going to see Alper and Shingun be a starter for this Houston Rockets team next season. He has proven it all throughout this year that he is a starting caliber player. And 
now that he's rounding out some of the areas of his game, he's mitigated some of the foul trouble. He's become a much more competent defender just as far as reading pick and rolls, anchoring the defense for this Houston Rockets team, kind of reading things on that end of the floor. He's going to be a starter next year. The question is really just, is he going to be starting alongside Christian Wood? Or is he going to be starting alongside one of the other bigs from the NBA draft? Or hell, is he going to be starting alongside Christian Wood and one of the other bigs from the NBA draft if, if the Rockets decide to go that point? I will lock it in right now. Alperin Shingun is going to be starting next year for the Houston Rockets. It's not a matter of if he's going to be starting. It's a matter of who is going to be starting alongside him. That is the question mark for this Houston Rockets team. It's not about whether or not he's going to start. He will absolutely be a starting player for this Houston Rockets team. And if he's not, I'm going to have to come back and eat these receipts off of this show specifically when we make it to next season. But as exciting as the impressive games were from Jalen Green, from Alper and Shingoon against this depleted Portland Trailblazers team, they were just that. They were a depleted Portland Trailblazers team are these empty wins for this Houston Rockets ball club? I want to talk about that coming up as well as the implications rounding out the tail end of this season between the teams kind of nosediving for the bottom of the of their respective standings, trying to increase their lottery odds, the tankathon teams, if you will, as well as the Brooklyn pick watch and the most recent update on that front. We're going to talk about that in just a quick moment after a message from our friends over at NBA Top Shot because Top Shot is the officially licensed NFT of the NBA. You can connect with a passionate community of NBA fans across the globe and build your collection with your favorite moments from NBA history. Look, NBA Top Shot is the future of what being an NBA fan looks like. It's part trading cards, part stock market, part fantasy sports with a built-in loyalty program. NBA Top Shot has evolved trading cards and made it easy to buy, sell, and trade by removing the hassle of card grading, shoe boxes, and binders. Their 24-7 peer-to-peer marketplace lets you scroll through all of your favorite players and teams. Once you find the moment that you've been looking for, you can buy it in just a couple of clicks. It is that easy. Now, I, you know, there's some concern, right? Like, why would you want to, you know, buy a highlight that you can look at on YouTube or, or find scrolling the timeline on your phone, right? It's not about, you know, the highlight in and of itself when you can view it elsewhere. It's about owning a moment in NBA history akin to trading cards of old, right? This is basically the next evolution in NBA fandom, right? If you remember trading cards growing up, if you remember talking to your parents about trading cards and kind of like sharing your favorite collectibles growing up, this is exactly what that is by combining the novelty of the NFT space and the, you know, the direction that NFTs are headed in today's society, as well as the exciting moments from the game that you love to watch. If you sign up today for Top Shot, the best way to start is getting yourself a starter pack. You can pull a moment of a superstar like LeBron or KD, or maybe a moment from Jalen Green, right? A future is something that could be worth a lot in the future, a really exciting moment to hold on to. And you can do that for just $9. So head to NBA Top Shot's website. Head over to LockedOn.NBATopShot.com to start building your collection today. And another message from our friends over at rockauto.com because look, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's basically impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Save time and money when using rockauto.com. Why choose to spend up to 30, 50, or even 100% more for the exact same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Here's a quick example. Honda Odyssey fuel pump is $353 from a chain store. It's only $216 from Rock Auto. Best of all, rockauto.com is a family business. They've been serving do-it-yourselfers online for over 20 years. The prices are always reliably low for every single customer. They don't price gouge you just because you're a DIY person, which is exactly how it should be. You shouldn't get charged more just because you know how to do some quick repairs to your vehicle. They've got everything you can need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even brand new carpet. So go explore their easy to use website today. Also, when you're getting ready to check out at Rock Auto, do me a favor. This is a really important part. Be sure to write Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Be sure to visit rockauto.com. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Let's talk about the impact of these two wins against the, you know, absolutely spiraling, quote unquote, retooling. Portland Trailblazers with no Damian Lillard, no nobody. There's not even three starters that I could name, you know, off the top of my head. But this Rockets team is headed for 
the NBA draft lottery and headed for the top of the NBA draft, hopefully, right? And the issue with this pair of wins and where I take a little bit of exception to kind of what happened essentially with this pair of wins, I think that they were largely unavoidable. Right, Unless the Rockets were willing to go out there and do some egregious level tanking, this pair of wins was probably unavoidable. That said, we're at the point in this season where I would like to see the Rockets pivot towards a full-blown direction towards, towards the youth. Right, they've, they've had a focus on the youth of this Rockets team for a majority of the season, but a full-blown pivot. And what I mean by that is you start shutting players down. Right, Shut down Eric Gordon and Dennis Schroeder for the rest of the season. I'd probably also shut down Christian Wood and maybe you throw Jay Sean Tate into that mix as well. I'm of I'm of the belief that, you know, Jay Sean Tate, well, he's maybe a bit more of has a bit more of a safety net as far as like his role in this Rockets young core moving forward. If you're gonna shut down Christian Wood, I feel like you also simultaneously should shut down Jay Sean Tate for the remainder of this Rockets season. They're both 26 years old. They both got a bit more reps as far as they're concerned, you know, compared to some of the other young guys on the roster. And when you look at, you know, who needs the minutes at those four or five spots, you could conceivably argue that you can soak up the rest of those minutes with Alperin Shingun, KJ Martin, and Usman Garuba and kind of just run a three-man rotation there at the four or five spot to get those guys all 30 plus minutes a night each for the remainder of the NBA season. That's what I would like to see. Are we going to see that? I don't know at this point. Your guess is as good as mine. You know, there's the the advantage, right, to shutting down some of those vets in Schroeder and Gordon and shutting down a guy like Christian Wood who's going to get you a bunch of points and, and get, you know, get his 20 and 10 every single night is you probably walk away a little bit better served in losing some of these remaining games because of how tightly contested the – standings are when it comes to the worst teams in the association. And here's the perspective, right? Right now, the Houston Rockets, Detroit Pistons, and Orlando Magic are all in a three-way tie for the worst record in the association, 20 and 55. The Oklahoma City Thunder are two losses behind that at 21 and 53. So there's a bit of a wiggle room between OKC, and then the Pacers are significantly far behind the pack at 25 and 50 on the season. So when you look at Detroit, Orlando, and Houston, and when you look at the pick odds and how they impact where the Rockets could conceivably fall this season, yes, the pick odds are the exact same for the worst three teams in the league as far as receiving a top three pick. Yes, absolutely. I get that. However, if you are the worst team in the association, the worst your record can be or the worst your pick can fall is down to pick number five. So you have a 12% chance across the board at pick number four if you are one of the worst three teams in the association, which that's Detroit, Orlando, and Houston right now. Sure. So the pick odds are the exact same across the top four picks. However, right now, if you're the worst team in the league, you have a 47.9% chance at the fifth pick meaning that is the lowest you can go. You can't fall to six or seven or eight. If you're the second worst record, you have a 27.8% chance at the fifth overall pick and then a 20% chance at pick number six. And then if you're the third worst team, you have a 14.8% chance at pick number five, a 26 point, uh, 26% chance at pick number six, and then a 7% chance at pick number seven. So, as you gradually get removed from being the worst team in the association, your odds at walking away with one of the top five picks or one of the top four picks diminishes. And because of the way that, you know, probability and chance works, you don't want to be in that mix for having a chance to be drawn at six or at seven or at eight. You don't want to be in those odds because then what happens is if another team has the chance, right? If another lottery team jettisons up the standings and, and jumps up into one of the, into the top four, you run the risk. You run a greater risk of being one of the teams that gets booted out of the top four. If you are, if you are at risk of being drawn for one of those other picks, so at this point in the season, I understand the, the desire to let the young guys play, right? And in this and in this pair of Brooklyn, uh, you know, in Brooklyn, wow, not what I wanted to say. In this pair of Portland Trailblazers wins, right? The Rockets kind of did just that, right? We saw them play a majority of the young guys. They walked. They were probably going to walk away with wins, whether or not they benched the vets or not. You know, it's not like you look across the board and you say. 
you know, it, like EG in the first night against the Portland Trailblazers didn't play the second night. In the first night, he played just 22 minutes and he had five points, right? It's not like EG had a huge impact on the game. Now you look at Dennis Schroeder, who had 14 points in 23 minutes, and Dennis Schroeder had a bit more of an impact on both of these games as well. He had 10 points in the second night of the back-to-back. -back. Like, maybe make the argument that the Rockets could have, you know, coughed up one of these games had they not played the Vets, or maybe if they had rested Christian Wood. That said, it's about making the point for the rest of this season as we look at the remaining part portion of this rocket schedule because i understand the argument you want to let the young guys play sure you don't want to establish now what the argument that i don't want to hear is you don't want to establish a losing culture the rockets have lost plenty of games this season right benching a few players for the last six seven games of the season is not going to quote unquote instill a losing culture at the tail end stretch of this season if anything i'd be perfectly content with the rockets running you know, the young guys exclusively start LP, start KJ Martin, bench Wood, bench Tate, bench the vets, all of this. And if they're competitive in these final six, seven games, cool. Let's let's see what the rookies can do. Let's see where they can take you. If they take you to some wins, all right. If they take you to some losses, all right. However, I would like to see some like legitimate tanking these final few games, right? If the Rockets are playing a hell of a game, they look really good going into the fourth quarter. Do some stuff like bench Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun for the remaining 12 minutes of the game, right? Give opposing teams a chance to claw their way back into games because you're seeing the Orlando Magic and the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Detroit Pistons do some very egregious stuff to tank their way to the bottom of the NBA standings, right? SGA being held out of the remainder of the season for a second year in a row for OKC to try and bottom out and get to the bottom of the standings. The Magic holding Wendell Carter Jr. out after he dropped a 30-piece, right, the game before. Things like that are happening with the other bottom feeder teams in the league, and I don't want to see the Rockets miss out on a top prospect just because we get a couple of feel-good wins at the end of the season against other teams that aren't even trying is the point. Here is my big point to nail home before taking a quick look at the remaining schedules for the Rockets and the other two teams that are closely contending for the Tankathon race. A win against like the LA Lakers, the way that the Rockets got that dub against the Lakers off the backs of you know a really impressive performance from the, the young guys and Jalen Green specifically taking over in the fourth quarter in overtime, that is a quality win. That is something you want. That is something you can build on. That is something you can look back on next year when you get to when you're looking back at this season. Yes. These Portland Trailblazers wins mean absolutely diddly squat. Because this Blazers team is not competing for anything. They have nobody out there. This isn't a this isn't a win you're going to look back on and think, yeah, that was a damn good win by the Rockets' young core, something that they can build on and look back on and be proud of. Absolutely not. There are maybe three or four legitimate NBA players on this Blazers roster. The rest of them are 10-day contracts, G League wannabes, all of that, right? End of bench players. Guys who wouldn't be in the rotation unless the Blazers were missing, you know, if because the Blazers are missing nine, nine of their usual players, right? So I don't think there's anything to be gained from these wins. It feels good to see Al P and Jalen Green have some impressive nights. Yes, I will give you that. However, in the grand scheme of things, this is very much akin to the Jeff Van Gundy era Houston Rockets. If you were around for the Tracy McGrady, Yao Ming era, you know just how painful it was to watch JVG pick up a couple of regular season wins off the backs of Jawan Howard, of all players, at the end of regular season in a season that was largely lost due to injury, all of that. And then the Rockets missed out on Brandon Roy, who would have been such an incredible prospect to pair with Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming and have that be the big three. The Rockets didn't get that, so then they had to draft Rudy Gay, and then they traded for Shane Battier. So that's exactly what is at risk here, right? This is the difference between walking away with one of the top four prospects in this year's NBA draft versus walking away with an AJ Griffin or a, an AJ Griffin, a Keegan Murray, a Benedict Matherin, any of those, any of those other kind of just outside of the top four type prospects, right? A Shaden Sharp, maybe like that, but that's not where the Rockets find themselves, right? They have a fine, they have a timeline now that has been started with the drafting of Jalen Green, the drafting of all these other young rookies. And there's only so many times that this team is going to conceivably be able to bottom out this way in conjunction with the fact that they don't own one of their, you know, some of their 
their future draft odds with the picks being owed to the Oklahoma City Thunder. So they've got a short window where they can conceivably bottom out, have full control of their picks, full control of their destiny, and take the prospect that they they think is going to put them over the hump down the hill, right? And so these two wins, it's already in the books. It's too late, right? However, I would have liked to see the Rockets organization be maybe a little bit proactive, maybe Rafael Stone reaching out and just being like, hey, Steven, pull the plug on Al P who's having a career night, right? Or maybe let's just, you know, rest all the, you know, re- let's let's just play the starters for the first half of this game or something to that effect. So that's where I'm at. That's kind of my message, my, my belief towards these two wins and the severity of how they could impact the standings. But when you look at, the rest of the games for the Houston Rockets, I do think that there's conceivably of these remaining seven games for the Rockets, I think that five of them, you've got teams that are vying for something. So I do think that the Rockets are looking down the barrel of at least five more losses, hopefully. Uh, And that's against the Spurs, the Timberwolves, the Brooklyn Nets, the Toronto Raptors, and maybe the Atlanta Hawks, the final game of the season. The two two games, the two home games back-to-back against the Sacramento Kings coming up here the rest of this week, The Kings aren't exactly playing for anything either. So those games could go either way. Even if the Rockets win both of those games, if they lose out the other five games against the Spurs, Timberwolves, Nets, Raptors, and Hawks, who are all still vying for some level of play-in contention or playoff seeding or something to that effect, then I think the Rockets are going to be safe to round out the end of the season. But just for a frame of reference, let's take a quick look at, we'll go to the the Orlando Magic first. The Magic have, as well... What one, two, three, four, seven games remaining in the season as well. And when you look at their schedule, they've got the Cavaliers, the Wizards, the Raptors, the Knicks, the Cavs again, then the Hornets and the Miami Heat. And of all those teams, it's really just the Wizards and the Knicks that don't have anything to fight for. So again, you put them in the same boat as the Rockets. They've got two games that are largely going to be gimmies where neither team is fighting for anything. And then you've got five games where the opposing team on the other end of the slate is fighting for some level of play-in or playoff positioning. So this is why I'm so thankful for the play-in tournament and its existence because some of these games that previously in previous years of the NBA wouldn't mean anything down the stretch, right? Teams would be resting their guys. They wouldn't be competing. Nothing would matter for these games down the stretch of the season. Now we're seeing some not only playoff and play-in implications, but we're seeing lottery implications be you know you know in play here at the end of the season, which is really exciting because it means that some of these teams facing the Orlando Magic to round out the season actually have reasons to want to compete, which helps the Rockets. So that's exciting. And then you look at the Detroit Pistons, and I believe when I looked at it before starting recording, I think they're in the same boat too. I think they might actually have six games. So they've got seven. So they've got seven games left as well. But of their seven games, yeah, no. So they've got another five as well that are going to be against teams that might be or could be still vying for playoff positioning and play in uh play in stature between the they've got Brooklyn Nets, Philadelphia 76ers, OKC Thunder and Indiana Pacers are the two throwaway games that the Pistons have remaining on their schedule. But the game against the OKC Thunder could have huge ramifications as far as the lottery is concerned. So that's going to be a huge game to keep your eye on Friday, April 1st, April Fool's Day. Going to keep a very close eye on that game. And then they've got the Dallas Mavericks, Milwaukee Bucks and then the last game of the season against the Philadelphia 76ers. So again, Two of those games, you throw them away. However, one of those has huge lottery implications against the OKC Thunder. And then the other five are going to be against teams that are still fighting for their playoff and play-in livelihoods. So the Rockets, Magic, and Pistons are all kind of in the same boat with two gimmies, two throwaway games, and five games against teams that are going to be actually competing for something to round out the end of the season, depending on how the schedules kind of shake out as we get closer and closer to the actual end of the season. Because some of those games, right, like the game against the Atlanta Hawks for the Rockets at the tail end of the season, that game may or may not matter for the Hawks once we actually get to that point if the Hawks have already locked themselves into a playing spot. If they have no wiggle room to move up and down on the standings, the Hawks may wind up resting all of their players in that that final regular season game for the Rockets. And then that becomes a third game for the Rockets. That is a complete gimme where the Rockets may walk away with a dub that impacts their play, their uh, tankathon standings. So a lot to consider as we're rounding out the season here. I spent a little bit more time on that than I probably wanted to. However, I do also want to toss in the thought or the, the, you know, notion here about the Brooklyn pick watch with the Brooklyn Nets losing to the Charlotte Hornets, the Hornets now holding the tiebreaker between the Nets and the 
uh, and, and the Hornets in the NBA standings. And with that, what that means is that currently the Brooklyn Nets pick owed to the Houston Rockets has found its way into the Tankathon lottery. And so I'm going to do a sim here really quick, and maybe we'll get a blessed sim where the Rockets walk away with a pair of top four picks if the Brooklyn pick jet, you know, jumps up in the standings. But right now, the Brooklyn pick is sitting at pick number 14 being conveyed to Houston. So let's sim this lottery really quick, see how lucky we can get if we are the Houston Rockets. Ooh, okay. It didn't jump up crazy high, but the Rockets walk away with the number two overall pick in this tankathon simulation. Brooklyn Nets stayed at number 14, but that's still really exciting. The Rockets walking away with pick number two and pick number 14, possibly even better if the Brooklyn Nets start to lose some games to round out the rest of the season. And hey, here's one more thing to take into consideration. The Rockets want to win that game against the Brooklyn Nets. So not only do the Rockets have two games against the Sacramento Kings that are potential wins just because the Kings aren't fighting for anything, the Rockets want to be able to win that game against the Brooklyn Nets. And now you're in a position where you may want to like seed that game to the Nets if it means protecting your own interests of the Rockets' own lottery pick. So winning these two games against the Blazers could have some negative ramifications as we look at the rest of the season for the Houston Rockets. But with that, Rockets get the number two overall pick in this Tankathon Sim. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send Chet Holmgren to the Orlando Magic because they've got so many guards, so much perimeter play already. I can't send them Jaden Ivy, and I feel like Chet Holmgren is gonna be the guy that they like risk it all on. So with that, that leaves Jabari Smith Jr. to Houston at number two overall. Sorry for all the Bancaro fans. I'm still not completely on. I've got a timeshare on Bancaro Island, but I'm not quite there just yet. He hasn't surpassed Jaden Ivey for me at this point. Maybe things change as we get closer to the draft, but that is going to do it for today's episode. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also, be sure to check out the new Locked on Rockets YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all of that. How did you feel about the Rockets' two wins against the, against the Portland Trailblazers? Were you just happy to see the young guys, Jalen Green, Alper, and Shingun performing well, or were you upset about the fact that it's going to impact their tankathon standings here at the tail end of the season? Let me know in the YouTube comments. I do read each and every one of those. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.